The 4th of July is coming up. We are about to celebrate once again our nation's independence, which is a great time to reflect on how our nation came into being and the nature of the history that we in fact celebrate on the 4th of July. So joining us now to help us with that, and I should say rejoining us because he's been with us before, we always enjoy having him. Major Danny Sherson is a, a military strategist, former history instructor at West Point. He has served tours uh, in both Iraq and Afghanistan. He's author of the book, uh, Ghost Riders of Baghdad, Soldiers, Civilians, and the Myth of the Surge. He's been writing a great series for Truth Dig on American history, on a you know kind of uh, real-world view of American history. And as always, he is speaking for himself and not for uh, any other institution to which he may belong. And with that, uh, Major Danny Sherson, welcome to the program. Well, thanks for having me back. I'm so glad to do it. Well, it's our pleasure to have you, and I've been really enjoying this series, including uh, uh, you've moved on beyond the um, beyond the revolution, of course, into some other eras in American history as well. But I want to start with with this. Uh, you know, one of the things when we're taught history in school, uh, especially in high school, secondary school, primary school, so on. Um, it's sort of presented as this neat, clean story. And we know how it begins, we know how it ends, uh, that we know who the good guys are, and um, there's no ambiguity, there's no confusion, there's no messiness. But one of the, one of the things I like about your Truth Dig series is that it, it, it gets the messiness of history, which to me is one of the fun things about it. You know, you've got people in different walks of life experiencing it in different ways, and their realities may be contradictory to one another even, but to each of them they're real. So, um, and as you, you reference in your series the fact that, you know, we're a lot of people are running around talking about making America great again, but when was it great? How, you know, to, uh, by whose standards and so on. So and when we celebrate the 4th of July and in American independence, what was that uh, fight for independence about to you? You posed the question, but I'd like to, in, in your writing, but I'd like to pose it back to you. Was it a people's revolution? Was it an idealistic revolution, a fight for democracy? Was it a, a mercantile class assertion of, you know, or, or pursuit of economic privilege? What was the American Revolution to you? Well, you know, with Fourth of July coming up, one of the things that I really encourage my readers to do is both um, take stock of the beauty of, say, Jefferson's language uh, on the 4th of July in 1776 in the Declaration of Independence, but also understand the contradictions at the heart of that revolution and of Jefferson and those words. And I think that's really important when we talk about why revolution or what the revolution was. The revolution was none of those things. It was all of those things you described. It was a social revolution. It was a revolution as much about who would rule here at home as about home rule from Britain. There were class factors, there were race factors, there were regional, southern, northern factors, then there were Native Americans involved, there, was, uh, uh, there were changes in gender roles. The American Revolution is really one of the, the, the major life-shaking events in this country, and yet it's been glossed over and it's been mythologized, and I would argue sanitized by myth makers, both historians uh, and lay citizens, and it's been used by politicians to feed their own narrative. Whether you're a liberal or a conservative, it is very likely that you are going to consistently go back to the founders and claim the legacy of the founding generation as your own. Well, that's a problematic thing because which founders are we talking about? These guys couldn't agree on anything. I mean, they were fighting as deeply about politics as Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. It was at least as rancorous. Yeah. I think the American Revolution is, is all of those things at once. And, and it's messy. In the sense that, you know, whose revolution was it a revolution just for white American colonists? Because the revolution looks very different to a black slave on a southern plantation. And it looks very different to a British loyalist who moves to Canada and certainly looks different from native country looking eastwards when we talk about Native Americans. 
Sure. And, and, and I think you also, you get into it a little bit later in your, uh, in your series in Truth Dig, but we also tend to sort of meld a multiple different events that to the people involved were, were very separated by time and space. We, we meld the sort of pre-revolutionary period with the fighting itself, with uh, the Constitutional Convention of uh, 1787, with uh, the election of Thomas Jefferson in 1800, and each of those things represented different forces going at each other. I mean, we could say that the revolution itself, you know, was an alliance of a lot of different interests and a lot of different groups coming together to expel the British. Not necessarily, by the way, and I don't know if you have different information on this, but not necessarily with a support of the majority of people uh, in living in this country at the time, if, unless the, the information has changed. What I was taught was that maybe a third of the people, uh, and by the people, we, 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 let's be clear, we mean white British descended colonists, maybe a third of them supported the revolution, maybe a third were loyalists, maybe a third didn't have an opinion either way. But so you have these groups fighting for independence, you have these neutral groups, these loyalist groups, and uh, but then you get into the sort of, well, what kind of country are we going to become? So I guess, first of all, two-part question, uh, is my analysis based on old texts of when I was in school, uh, is that still basically uh, agreed upon, that there was a kind of confluence of forces and that not everybody was on board with the revolution idea? Yeah, absolutely. You are correct. Um, so often this, this story is told as one of patriots versus tyrannical Brits, but the reality was much more complex. It is probably more apt to describe the American Revolution as the first American Civil War because uh, no more than two-thirds of Americans ever supported the patriots. At most points, it was closer to one-third uh, approximately a third of Americans were loyalists, some who fought for the British against the patriots, and about a third of the people were fence sitters, waiting to see how this worked out, just hoping to maintain their farms and their family. So this is a civil war. John Adams himself, years after the revolution, in a letter to uh, one of his many correspondents, says that uh, at most two-thirds of the people were ever with us. And in that sense, he said, uh, divided we have always been, and divided we shall ever be. And I can't think of anything more apt for today's political discourse. Um, oftentimes when we say we want to make America great again, that implies there was a time of unification, of, of, of absolute concurrence and unity behind certain values. But even at the founding, even at the start of this uh, nascent republic, we are wildly divided. And, and I think it's important to frame the American Revolution as a civil war. And that's something I spent a lot of time on with my cadets, uh, my students at West Point when I taught American history. You know, and, and what's, what's also striking to me about that, and again, we're talking with Major Danny Shearson about American history, and especially about uh, uh, on this upcoming, as the 4th of July approaches independence, the striking with that math is that, you know, if you look at politics today, and some people think we're, you know, it's a kind of a, 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 a civil war, at least uh, a non, so far primarily nonviolent one. But, um, you know, again, you have a third of the public maybe aligning itself with Democrats and to the left of that, a third of the public might be aligning themselves with Republicans. I don't know how far to the right of that you can go nowadays. And others are just not voting. We don't know what they think. So, um, but in terms of combatants of today, we, we still have a, seem to have a similar divided society. So uh, I think part of what you're saying is uh, the myth, part of the myth is that we were ever unified in purpose and belief, right? Absolutely. And another thing to keep in mind when we talk about the patriots, okay, the patriots, the patriot founders, is their, many of their techniques for garnering support were undemocratic. There was a lot of mob rule and violence. There was violence and coercion at the heart of this movement. So to be a loyalist was uh, to be in danger for your life in many cases if you were in a patriot area. And the patriot militias and the patriot mobs or, or groups uh, on the street often use violence and coercion to, uh, to force loyalty to the new republic. 
to force loyalty to the patriot cause. And that complicates our view of what we think of as a groundswell of democratic support for the revolution. I'll give you one example. When I was in Afghanistan, one of the things we fretted about in the villages were something called night letters. And night letters were these threatening notes or pamphlets that the Taliban would essentially nail on the doors of the village mud huts, basically saying, uh, which was interesting because most people couldn't read, but it would basically say, if you support the Americans, you're a traitor and you better watch out. We're coming for you. Well, as I studied the American Revolution, I found out that in the run-up to the war, patriots were doing the very same things. They were leaving night letters and pamphlets on the walls uh, and doors of loyalist homes or of neutrals' homes saying, you better watch out. Take care of your family and your goods if you choose to trade with the British or support the British. These were, these were veiled threats. So it gets back to the violence and coercion at the heart of the revolution. That doesn't take away from the beauty of some of the words of the founders, from the, uh, the strength of the, of the American Republic's governing institutions when they're properly utilized. But it's important to recognize that messy side of the revolution. Not every part of it was democratic. Tarring and feathering mm. was torture on the streets of Boston, torture on the streets of New York used to, um, to ensure loyalty and to coerce loyalty uh, from people to the new patriot cause, which may or may not at any one time have actually constituted the majority. So there's something non-majoritarian and non-egalitarian about our American Revolution that we have to keep in mind. So it's important to remember that, you know, in the words of another uh, insurgent of the 20th century, that a revolution is not a dinner party, that it is an ugly and sometimes messy thing. And I think in a way by, uh, uh, by sanitizing these aspects of the revolution, even though, of course, we, most of us endorse the ideals of that revolution as they were expressed or as we know them today, uh, that when we sanitize it, what we do is we also sanitize war, don't we? I mean, we... Absolutely. Um, and, and so now one of the other things that I think it's important for us to remember is that as we look back on the revolution, we have a tendency to take the political divisions of today, the political perspectives of today, our own, our opponents, and so on, and project them on the figures, the famous figures of the revolution and the years following. But, you know, as you, as you illustrate, I, I don't know that you directly pointed out, but you certainly demonstrate when you write, for example, about uh, Jefferson's ascension to the presidency, or when I think about a figure like Hamilton, for example, uh, that these people, they don't fit neatly into the boxes we have today. You know, Hamilton was, we would th might think of him as, you know, a corporatist in certain ways, or a guy representing uh, what we now describe as Wall Street, the moneyed interests, but his also his interest in, in centralized federal governance serves what we think of as more left or liberal ideas or central bank and that sort of thing. Right. So, so at Jefferson, you know, one of the things you point out that, that is fascinating to me is that, you know, he's an almost universally idealized figure today or was until people started pointing out that he had slaves and, uh, and took advantage of them uh, in, in terrible ways. Uh, he, before that, he was an uncontroversially uh, adored figure, I would say, in American history. But when he became president, he was, uh, some people loved him, but many people just despised him, right? Yes, he's one of the more polarizing figures in American history. The election of 1800 between Jefferson and John Adams, uh, who were old friends, uh, who, who really turned into enemies, and then later in life uh, they came back and became friends again in their later correspondence in old age. But the things that were said about John Adams and the things that were said about Thomas Jefferson by the opposing newspapers from the Federalist Party, which was Adams, and the Re Republican Party or the uh, Democratic Republicans under Jefferson were would actually – put to shame even the worst things that were said in the 2016 uh, that children's bodies would writhe on pikes and there would be death in the streets and pederasty abroad if Jefferson was elected and that if you elected Adams you were really electing a monarch and a, a pro-British traitor so the, I mean the rhetoric was, was unbelievable what's fascinating is both sides of the political spectrum today want to claim the mantle of all of these founders and yet they, they so little understand these men. They, still, they so little understand the complexities and in some cases the contradictions within the character and the ideology of these figures. Remember the Tea Party movement at the end of Barack Obama's first term election. 
It is no accident that the Tea Partiers would consistently wear tri-corner hats and wave revolutionary-era flags and symbols. That's because the American Revolution is alive and well today. We are still very much contesting those values from the revolutionary era in our own times. But what's fascinating is, like you point out with Jefferson, people cherry-pick which aspects of the founders they choose to admire – and they only pick those aspects which they believe cohere with their modern views. And that's not how we should study history. We should not study history from a presentist point of view. We should look at it in its own time and understand the context. I think so often the American Revolution, the American Civil War, and other key events in American history are so wildly taken out of context. And also they just make factual errors. OK, um, if you ask the average tea party or on the street dressed in a tri-corner hat and colonial garb, he's going to make most of the time massive factual errors in his attempt to claim the mantle of these revolutionaries. You know, and unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. But I would add that so would the uh, average, well-educated, elite politician uh, of the mainstream and the bipartisan consensus, I have to chuckle. Maybe we'll have you back on at some point to talk about civility, because I have to chuckle when people say, you know, this is a, an unprecedented era of incivility. I mean, people used to beat each other unconscious with their canes on the floor of the House of Representatives. Absolutely. So, so uh, Challenge each other to duels and kill one another. And kill each other, yeah. Um, so... But unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. Major Danny Sherson, a great work on this series for Truth Dig, on history for American history for truth diggers. And uh, as always, great talking to you. Great talking to you, too. I hope to be back soon. Yeah, we'll have you back soon.